world, this is a common problem. Maybe a little less so now in Vietnam, but I suspect that the incidence will go up as economics change, lifestyles change, as you eat more Kentucky Fried Chicken, <laughs> something like that. Uh, so it's important to understand this sequence. So what is Barrett's esophagus? Well, there are several definitions, and it's important to understand a little bit about the nuance, the differences between those definitions. So American Gastroenterology Association in 2008 said, change in the distal esophageal epithelium any length that can be recognized endoscopically as columnar type mucosa at endoscopy and has intestinal metaplasia on biopsy. So this is endoscopically visible, columnar mucosa and intestinal metaplasia. Now, when we Using this definition, when a pathologist looks at a biopsy, what can we recognize? Well, we can recognize this, or we can recognize this, but we don't know whether it came from up here or down here, so we can't tell for sure if it's in the esophagus. <clears throat> so um, we say, intestinal metaplasia or columnar mucosa, and then the endoscopist says, I was distal esophagus, so therefore this is Barrett's esophagus. That's how the diagnosis is made. The pathologist doesn't say Barrett's esophagus. The pathologist says what is present histologically. And then the clinical and pathological comes together to make the diagnosis. Now, a little more recently, um, the AGA again s changed the definition slightly, saying any extent of metaplastic epithelium that predisposes to cancer and replaces stratified squamous epithelium. So that's different, right? The, the thought process here, however, is, is, is important. So in the American gastroenterologist's mind, it's this change that predisposes to cancer. So if we see just columnar mucosa, but no intestinal metaplasia, in America they say no or little risk of progression to cancer. That's partly an economic decision, because if we followed everyone who had any type of columnar mucosa, it would be very expensive. Too many people to follow, though. So we limit it to those who have intestinal metaplasia as this linkage. Um, in Europe, the British Society of Gastroenterology uses a different definition Again, endoscopically apparent in the esophagus, and they say it just has to, has to have columnar epithelia. So they don't require intestinal metaplasia to call it Barrett's, and they also follow those people as though they have some risk of cancer. Uh, it's not really clear yet. The data isn't all in to say who's right, who's wrong. Um, we sometimes see cancers where we don't find residual intestinal metaplasia. So it could be that this definition will win in the end. But right now, we're still, we still work with this one. So is this clear? Is this, which definition do you use? OK. Huh? 
Yeah, so I'll talk more about the reporting with, with this question of what do we report and how do we differentiate? Is it predisposing to cancer? But essentially, it's this change. Do we see intestinal type goblet cells? If we see goblet cells or paneth cells that are truly intestinal type, then we assume that they have cancer risk and then they move to more frequent follow-up, uh, more biopsies, to look for dysplasia, to look for progression. Or they move to other treatments to lower the risk, and we'll talk about those too. Um, so first of all, what's metaplasia? So um, there are a couple of things to remember. Um, and so here's an example over here of esophageal biopsy, columnar mucosa, but no intestinal changes. Over here, we start to see the beginnings of goblet cells and so forth, but not on the surface. Uh, here we see some cells that look a little bit like goblet cells, but they're still pink. So sometimes we call these pseudo-goblet cells. Um, they don't have true mucins that are from, that are characteristic of the, the small bowel or colon. So uh, I, I use the term pseudo-goblet cells for these. And sometimes I will do a, a, an Alcyon blue stain or another stain to prove that, that these are neutral mucins, not acid mucins and therefore not intestinal. Um, here's a more fully developed form, lots of goblet cells and so forth on the surface. Um, and here's another example here where you have partial areas over here and then other areas that, you know, maybe some down deep, but other areas that don't. So it, it can just depend on where the biopsy comes or if you get enough biopsies to, to make this diagnosis. So you have to, they have to sample liberally to be able to find these areas and call it Barrett's esophagus and see if there is, is risk. Because they can't tell the difference endoscopically between this or this right now. Now I'll show you a method that may change that uh, using in vivo microscopy. So we'll, we'll look at that in a minute. Um, the other thing that happens with Barrett's is that there is a stromal change. Um, and that stromal change is essentially a duplication. So here is the normus, normal muscularis mucosa, and when you get Barrett's developing, it makes another muscularis mucosa. So you get two layers of muscle. And you get a lamina propria here and a lamina propria here, but just one submucosa down here. This is very important to know when you start to stage cancer. Because if you have cancer developing up here and it invades to here, but not down to here, it's completely curable. If you have cancer develop up here and it goes through the muscularis mucosa, then the risk of metastasis goes down, or excuse me, goes up. And so you have to treat it more aggressively. The other thing that can happen is that sometimes it will pull smooth muscle up into the lamina propria. For benign glands like this, no problem. But when these are dysplastic glands, or they look, or you have ulceration, it can make it very hard to say invasion, no invasion, that sort of a question can be very difficult. So remember these two changes uh, when you start to evaluate early invasive cancer. Other things that you can see, uh, paneth cells, and I talked about uh, the, 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 the mucin changes. Uh, you can also get the development of some neuroendocrine type cells in these 
thing, so they will have neuroendocrine markers. Um, and occasionally, this is a, an alcyon blue stain. And so it's easy to see that we have these goblet cells that are positive here with acidic mucin. But the other thing that you see here is that these other cells, not goblet cells, have acid mucin too. Usually these would be negative or neutral. So they would be negative with alcyn blue, they would be positive with PAS for mucins. So this is a, a variant on metaplasia that is intestinal versus not, where, where you would have these were more, more neutral, they would not have this pattern. Not really critical, but sometimes it's a variant. So some people call these uh, um, columnar blue cells uh, because they have the acid mucin in them. Uh, so you have goblet cells and columnar blue cells, both would be saying intestinal metaplasia, is that correct? PANF cells definitely have intestinal metaplasia. So any of these findings would also say risk of neoplasia, intestinal metaplasia is present. Okay, now dysplasia in Barrett's esophagus. Uh, this is a hard diagnosis. Uh, this is not something for, uh, for someone who is inexperienced. Uh, because it's very difficult to be reproducible. So it's, I want you to understand the criteria and then recognize the importance of the diagnosis and figure out what resources you can use for help. So how do we define it? Well, clearly neoplastic change. In other words, high-grade cytologic atypia, not just reaction maybe also some architectural. So that's not a very good definition. Very much subjective. The important decision points though, right now, are is there dysplasia or no dysplasia? No dysplasia, follow up in a year. Yes dysplasia, follow up in three to six months multiple biopsies, repeated follow-up, more expense, more problem, more risk. So this is really the critical decision. And every report that we put out, put out that says, you know, intestinal metaplasia or Barrett's, we also say dysplasia, yes or no. Okay, so that's the first important issue. And then the second question is, low-grade dysplasia or high-grade dysplasia? Again, difference in follow-up. High-grade dysplasia, biopsies every centimeter, circumferential, et cetera, et cetera. More biopsies, more frequent follow-up. Or maybe even esophagectomy in some settings. The problem. Pathologists have a hard time agreeing about low-grade dysplasia. So we're not very consistent, even ourselves. We see the same biopsy in six months, we call it low-grade. Six months later, we call it negative. So we're not reproducible. A little better with high-grade dysplasia, you know, maybe 70, 80 percent reproducible, but not 100 percent. So that's uh, one of the problems. So recognizing this problem, we do a couple of things. We have consensus. We show several people. We get their opinion. Uh, we make sure that we pretty much agree and have seen all the same things. Maybe we do several levels on the block to get multiple areas in the same sample to look at. Um, and so that helps to tighten the range a little bit. Now there's another term called indefinite for dysplasia. Have you heard or used that term? No? I very occasionally I will use it. And I'll explain some of the situations uh, where we would use this. But primarily, 
it's in um, the situation where we can't make this decision for some reason. Either it's very inflamed, or there's ulceration and regeneration, or it's just not quite, or something else is not quite right. Uh, but that's usually when 